for you poetry lovers, a poem by Billy Collins called No Time. In a rush this weekday morning, I tap the horn as I speed past the cemetery where my parents are buried side by side under a smooth slab of granite. Then, all day long, I think of him rising up to give me that look of knowing disapproval while my mother calmly tells him to lie back down. <laughs> that look of knowing disapproval, does that sound familiar? Can you conjure up in your mind that look that you have received from someone anywhere along the line? A teacher, a parent, a pastor, a coach, somebody that you respected and liked or <laughs> didn't. Yeah, that look of knowing disapproval. So do you suppose that this poem is part of Billy Collins' way of dealing with that look that he received from his father probably more than once, sounds like. He has another poem in which he goes and lies down in the grass next to his parents' graves and asks them, how do you like my new glasses? And he hears his mother say, they make you look very scholarly. Motherly approval. And from his father, he hears nothing. Silent disapproval. There's a saying ascribed to William Faulkner in which he says, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Our past, our history follows us everywhere, and we can deal with it or not as we choose to, but it's there and it has energy and it affects us. John says to Jesus, Lord, we, we saw this guy who's not one of us. And that phrase is actually in the text twice, but in the New Revised Standard Version, they just do it once. He's not one of us. He's not following us. But he was casting out demons in your name. He was healing people in your name. So we told him to quit it because he's not following us. And Jesus said, why in the world will you do that? If he's not actively opposing what we're about, then he's with us. If he's not undermining, if, if they're not pushing back and undermining us, then they're going the same way we are. They're called by God in the same direction we are. Why would you stop them? One of the commentators I read suggests that this is not only a message from Mark to his community around the year 70 when he writes, his Galilean community, which would be a more open, progressive community, inviting all kinds of people in, but also that it's a message maybe to the Jerusalem church headquarters, Nashville, United Methodist lingo, saying, you know, this movement is bigger than you or us, so we don't have to all be on the same page all the time. So what if we don't have the same language and the same rituals and the same theology and, and the same uh, uh, vestments and whatever else, same style? That doesn't matter. What matters is people who are called to live into the kingdom of God, who are doing that, trying to do that actively, why would you stop them? Why would anybody stop them? So, even a cup of water shared, or a cup of coffee, or maybe a glass of beer at Spirit of Hops, could be an expression of grace, a communion experience, an expression of God's work in our midst. I love that. That feels fitting for this church, and it feels right. Opening up, inviting, engaging, calling everybody. And I wish that Jesus or Mark or both had just stopped there. <laughs> but they don't. They go on and they take that wicked turn. 
And so Jesus says, but if any of you get in the way of any of these little ones trying to live out their call who have faith, Oh, you are in trouble. It would be better for you if you had a giant millstone hung around your neck and hold on to that mid-toss. It's 1964. Vacation Bible School. Grace Methodist Church, Vernon Center, Minnesota. Little town, 300 people, 333. Little Methodist Church but kids everywhere. Those were the days, you know, where everybody had umpteen kids. And so you always, there were more kids than you had room. And even that church they built on an education wing, they didn't have room for all the kids when they all showed up. In Vacation Bible School, kids showed up. I was in the third grade, the third and fourth grade. Third grade is small, fourth grade is big. They put us together. We didn't even have room. We had a space on the floor between two rooms. And we were with Miss Hansen, spelled with an O, who had been recruited by church leadership because she had been somewhere working some exotic place, and she was going to come and share that experience with us. So we're all sitting on the floor, on this cement floor, and she's up in front of us sitting on a little stool. And there are no other boys in my grade, third grade, so I'm sitting in the back with the fourth grade boys who are hellions. And they are living up to their reputation, behaving or misbehaving as they always do, being disruptive, noisy, but, but not being such that, that Miss Hansen goes off on them, just staying below the radar with their disruptive behavior. And then suddenly, Jerry, of Jerry's little green bike fame, hauls off and elbows me square in the gut, and I don't see it coming. And I make that sound that you make when someone hits you in the gut and you don't see it coming. Like that. And I am suddenly above the radar. And Miss Hansen points at me, says, you. She won't say my name because Hansen, for me, is spelled with an E the right way, and she will not go there. Or she doesn't know my name, which is probably more likely. Anyway, she says, you, stand up. So I stand up. Come up here. So I thread my way through this crowd of kids. And there's probably 15 kids or more in this little cluster. Stand right here, right beside her. Now sit down, she says. So I sit on the floor right beside her. Miss Hansen, spelled with an O. And she said, maybe you'll be able to behave yourself if everyone keeps an eye on you. Oh, my God. I'm dying a thousand deaths here because I'm a good kid. I don't misbehave. I'm scared of misbehaving. I'm scared of getting in trouble. It never leads to any good. So I try really hard to do nothing, and I... I now am the designated troublemaker sitting up front. My face is so hot, I feel like it's just going to melt right off my head. And the fourth grade boys think this is great. If she had called Kim or Jeff or Jerry and made them sit up front, they would have worn it as a badge of honor. I'm horrified. I am so ashamed. I can't look anybody in the face. I'm looking at the floor, hoping to find a crack in the cement that I can just melt and ooze into and disappear. I didn't tell my mom about this until I was probably 45. <laughs> I never told my dad. He never knew. I was so ashamed even though I'd done nothing. To be made to come up front like that was just horrifying to me. Now, how I ended up doing this, God only knows, but, hmm, so be careful. But I'll tell you what. Miss Hansen better look out because Jesus says it, right? Woe to any of you 
who put a stumbling block in front of these little ones who are trying to live out their faith, trying to answer their call. It'd be better for you, Miss Hanson, if a, if a giant millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. I wouldn't want to be in her weighted down wet shoes, I'll tell you that. But, at the same time, I would bet you that Miss Hansen forgot all about that and went on her way. She's probably not the one who's carrying around this still feeling shamed resentfulness decades later, half a century later. Huh. <laughs> so, maybe the second part applies to me. If your hand causes you to stumble, if your eye causes you to stumble, if your foot causes you to stumble, if, if something in you causes you to resent somebody else who did something to you years ago or yesterday, and if you carry those feelings of resentment, if that's messing you up, which it is, then that's your stuff to deal with. That's on you. And notice it doesn't say, now you're deputized as church members to go out and cut off the offending pieces and parts of other people. And there's also another reading of this text that says it's about the body of the church. I'm not going there today. It's my stuff to deal with. So I am. <laughs> I'm telling you about it. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul, right? Getting it out there is part of the work of healing, of dealing with the stuff we carry around. It's facing the fire, so to speak. It's salting the wound to cleanse it, cauterizing the wound so it can heal. That process that we're always called to be working on as individuals, as the collective. Better to do that and deal with that pain and discomfort than to bury it within yourself, carry it around as that little personal hell that every once in a while flares up and burns you and those around you. It's like when you have a bad day at work and you go home and kick the dog and yell at somebody who had nothing to do with it. Same sort of thing. By the way, hell in the text is Gehenna. That's the Greek for the valley of the son of Hinnom, which was a ravine or a shallow valley outside of the city of Jerusalem that in Jesus' time had become a garbage dump, so it was smoldering always with burning garbage. But centuries before, it had been a place where supposedly child sacrifice was practiced, sacrificing children to the god Molech. And so it becomes synonymous with hellish, damnable activity and a place of damnation. So now then, in that context, we could talk about how we are sacrificing our children and our grandchildren by turning their future into a burning garbage dump by not being able to get it together and deal with climate change in a forthright and honest way. By not dealing with our racist past and our exploitation of people and treating people of color as though they're not really people. Our use of resources and misuse and what that leads to. And maybe the, the plague, the current plague that we all know about, the fire that is all around us, and that is gunfire, gunfire, gunfire. We are sick to death and killing ourselves and our children with our addiction to guns. And we refuse to face it. The Second Amendment needs to be rewritten. It needs to be fixed because it doesn't fit. It's killing us. We're killing each other. We're killing our children, for God's sake. I heard an interview of uh, Jason Mott several weeks ago. And he was, he, he's uh, written a book um, 
about what it's like to be black in this country. It's a novel, but he tells stories of how ugly and painful and violent and frightening it can be to be a black person in this country. And then he tells stories about how crazy and hilarious and ridiculous it can be. And he alternates the stories. Because if he told one long set of those ugly, painful, frightening stories, it would be unreadable. And if he told just a whole set of the funny, crazy stories, we wouldn't take the issue seriously. And we would continue to not deal with the racism that is part of our past, that is part of our present, that still is, that follows us around as a people all the time, that exerts its influence on us, that burns us. The fire we need to face, the wounds we need to heal. And the book is titled simply, A Hell of a Book. A hell of a book. Now, I find that intriguing. I got it on my reading list. I think that's a must read. So, I would ask you, is this then a hell of a sermon? Or a heck of an effort at a message? Or is it just maybe a little necessary salt in the wound? And if it burns a little bit, my understanding is that means it's working. Amen.